we're rolling. Broken bones beneath my feet Oh, forgotten songs Words that bid a fast retreat When no one sang along I dig them up like fossil fire Search them for a clue Maybe there's a hidden sign To bring me back to you Sometimes there's a shining one A diamond in the room If I can't love enough, let me love enough. Like a wound that cut too deep, you wore it on your sleeve. A heart I thought I'd always keep. Never heard you leave. How did it happen for you? I mean, you went you went to school, graduated from college. I mean, how do you go from that to traveling the world with Billy Joel and yeah. Foreigner? Yeah, and it's funny because uh, when it really happened for me was uh, when I was in high school and I used to fall asleep at night with headphones on, imagining I was part of Genesis playing Seconds Out, the live record. And uh, I think just uh, relentless hours of visualization and imagining myself in that situation uh, really helped because it, it sort of uh, lets the universe know what your intentions are. So other than that, you got to get pretty, pretty lucky, I think. Uh, and I did. I was in a place, uh, I went, finished my uh, college degree in political science at Indiana University which has a great music program. So while I wasn't in the uh, technical music program per se, with all the theory and history classes and stuff, um, I did uh, take advantage of all the bands and the practice rooms and the facilities and the teachers and all the musicians so that uh, for all intensive purposes, while I was studying political science, I was a music student and it allowed me to uh, be found, I want to say, by um, a guy from Gary, Indiana. His name is Charles Telefero. And he and his sister had a band called Kilo in Bloomington, Indiana, which if you find somebody that lived in Bloomington, Indiana from 1982 through roughly 84, they will know who Kilo is. We, we were a dance band, a funk band. And uh, the lead singer in the band is a girl named Crystal Telefero who later was picked, cherry-picked from our band by John Mellencamp, who was John Cougar back then. And so she went off to have her big-time career, and uh, the rest of us, one at a time, got lucky. And, uh, well, I moved to New York at, at 1988 after doing the college town Midwestern five clubs a night, five sets of cover songs a night, circuit for about four or five years, which is what they mean by dues. Um, so when I was done with that, I moved to New York finally in 1988. And because of the people I knew at Indiana University, um, a lot of sound engineers that studied there, a lot of musicians that studied there, famous musicians that studied there, I was able to make some phone calls when I got to New York, let people know I was there. and. Lo and behold, within a couple months' time, I had a great opportunity with an artist named Grayson Hugh, who was a new artist at the time. And he had just completed a, 
a sort of an R&B soul record and was doing a support tour for, of all people, uh, Ian Hunter from uh, All the Young Dudes fame. And uh, so I went out on my first tour, real tour, for about six weeks. It was amazing because I just moved to New York. Didn't pay very much, but I didn't care. I shared a room with my buddy Zachary Alford, who was the drummer, who it was our both, both of our first tours. And Zach has since played with everyone from David Bowie to Billy Joel to you name it, uh, B-52s. But uh, we were sharing rooms in Motel 6s and loving it. And uh, after that, got back to New York City and boy, things just didn't go right like I thought they would at that point. I thought you'd just show up and get gigs all over the place and oh boy, here we go. And no, it wasn't like that at that point. Uh, really had nothing going on for about three months and uh, I know that doesn't sound like a lot to some people, but it sure, sure does seem like a long time when you're living it. Uh, doing, you know, top 40 type of gigs. I actually got a one gig that was very cool at the top of the, at the time it was the Marriott in Times Square. I think it's still the Marriott, I'm not sure. But there was a rotating restaurant on the roof and played there a lot, which was a lot of fun, paid okay in New York City, it's good to make money and live there. Um, then I got really lucky because my roommate was a guy named A.J. Corelli, who in the music business is known as a network expert. <laughs> Let's put it that way. He's a lawyer who, when he was a kid, worked for John Mellencamp as a roadie and worked his way up and was trained by some of the best entertainment lawyers in the world, eventually worked for Epic Records at my little MIDI setup, my little setup in the apartment. I'd always be doing songs and writing things. He picked up a cassette when he liked something he heard. And one, of these, one day he put one of these cassettes on a guy named Harry Sandler's desk. And Harry Sandler was a tour manager for Billy Joel. And it just happened to be the time when Billy Joel fired his manager and his band because his manager, I guess, stole a lot of money. And uh, you might have remembered this in the press. But I got lucky and my cassette wound up on this gentleman's desk and he made a phone call to Billy when the word came out that Billy was looking for a keyboard player. And make a long story short, I was on a train to Southampton, actually Montauk, the next day. Billy picked me up himself in his SUV, which was, seemed completely weird to me, and uh, hung out with him at his house overnight. He was writing his album Stormfront with a big notebook and a glass of scotch, and he'd sent his family away, and that's all he did for two months. I watched him write that record, and the next day we had a rehearsal. I played with the band, uh, which had Liberty DeVito and Skylar Deal and David Brown and Mark Rivera and... Uh, some of my best friends to this day in the band. And uh, after the rehearsal, Billy told me I was in the band. And I went from having a dollar to having a dollar and being in Billy Joel's band. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that was a good thing. And uh, stole my most impressive resume item. Did a uh, tour, did two albums with Billy, uh, Stormfront and River of Dreams. Stormfront was produced by Mick Jones, a foreigner. So um, Mick liked what I was doing and uh, we became close and he actually is the reason I'm doing this, I think, because at this point, because whereas Billy Joel before that really never had a keyboard player on any of his albums. He had keyboard players that were on tours and their names would be on the album, but they wouldn't actually play anything really. Uh, in my case, Mick threw me in the room with the new engineer who was also 25 years old and we went to town for like a week and when that album came out and it was mixed, I was all over it and it was great. 
uh, because immediately I started working in New York for Phil Ramone, for uh, Julian Lennon, for Mick, different projects, you name it. Uh, it was unbelievable. Everything I'd ever wanted to do in music was happening, and boy, was that fun. <laughs> uh, I guess I did, I did the, uh, the Stormfront tour with Billy Joel, which took 16 months, very long. It was unbelievable. We played, it was his biggest tour ever. We played Yankee Stadium twice. We played Giant Stadium twice. We played the Nassau Coliseum 12 times, I think, over Christmas. We played, it was just unbelievable. Every city we went to, we played eight shows, 10 shows. We would go somewhere and live there for a month, uh, which is really unheard of these days. It was, Billy's album was number one on Christmas Day. The single was number one on Christmas Day. And here I was on my first record, number one album, number one single, and just seemed crazy.